the, the, the Gemara in Baba Basra mentions that he had 30 boys and 30 girls and um, 120 feasts he did. So one of the commentaries says it's because uh, when they were born, he made a, uh, a, a feast. Michel Noildu, I see a Rabbeinu Gershon, that uh, um, so he, he uh, it seems like, you know, he, he got extra, the extra 60 is from when they were born. Well, the Chabad Org has a different explanation. Right, right. So there's a Rabino Gershon here, and uh, it seems that one, the other opinion is that he had uh, parties in the father's house and in the father-in-law's house. That's uh, maybe the other explanation. But uh, these are the two uh, explanations of the, uh, that, I, that I saw of the 120 feasts. Now, I, I did also see, we were trying to figure out how it's possible that Boaz would have been so cheap and mean to Manoyach not to invite him to his 120 feasts just because Manoyach couldn't um, it wouldn't be able to reciprocate doesn't seem like a tzaddik like Boyaz would, would, would care so much. Again, the Gemara we quoted this Gemara the Gemara said that he did not invite Manoyach uh, to any of these 120 feasts. And, um, and he said it's not worth inviting him. He is a sterile mule. How will he pay me back? Because he doesn't have children. He's not going to end up uh, inviting me to his feasts. That doesn't seem like he could have figured that out if 60 of those feasts are when his children are born, because that would have to be about 20 or 25 years earlier. He doesn't know the other guy is not going to have children. Well, uh, it could be that Manayach was older than him. Yes. He was married, was married, you know, for a number of years before him. What was their so, relationship? How, why would he have expected to be invited? Was he a neighbor? So it, it seems that he, they were both righteous individuals, holy people, um, and possibly lived near each other. But the Gemara does compare the two. The Gemara does imply like he should have been invited. And the Gemara says, because of this, all of the children of Boaz died during his lifetime. And... Um, and uh, this was considered a punishment to, uh, to Boaz, not being sensitive to Manoyach. So, so that's how the, uh, the Gemara does definitely expected him to invite them. It doesn't say clearly, did they live near each other? Did they, uh, you know, what their, what their relationship was? We do we do see a relationship here in Shaiftim that right after, uh, a little after the Shaifet, who's called Ivtson, comes uh, the Shaifet, whose name is Shimshon. I, I, I won't say immediately after, but shortly thereafter, a few verses later, and um, Shimshon is the son of Manoyach. Manoyach, who could not have any children, ultimately did have a child, and um, and the Gemara 
you know, implies like, look at, look at how uh, uh, all of his children died, but uh, Manayach ended up uh, having a child. Um, So, Rabbi, could you please tell me what um, what verse we're on? What verse and chapter, please? So, so we're not really starting yet. We're we're in chapter thirteen, but we're talking now uh, about chapter twelve. We're so we're going over a few points that we left off. We left hanging. Thank you. So, so we mentioned that it, it was a little unclear how it's possible that. Boaz was so, uh, you know, money hungry or gift hungry. And uh, so I, I, I mentioned the thought that maybe um, Boaz was, was uh, thinking that it's going to be too painful to Manoyach to come to his events and, uh, and um, you know, and, and he'll have to suffer through them and better if he doesn't invite him. And uh, maybe that's why he was trying to, you know, to, to minimize the pain of Manayach so he wouldn't have to come and feel obligated to come and yet you know, uh, be in pain when he sees, you know, when he sees all the, this great simcha of his friend, and yet he's not going to have it. And, uh, and it's understandable. In other words, Bayaz, you can understand where he's coming from. It, it, so it turns out that the Ben Yehoyada, there is a commentary that explains this uh, in these, uh, he says that, um, he totally didn't care about the money. He felt bad that he'll be embarrassed that when he invites him and, um, and he'll feel that he, well, he's not going to be able to pay him back, meaning that he's not going to, he doesn't have any such simchas. So, so what, what comes out from this is that what you see is how important it is to, um, you know, to, you still have to invite. If they don't want to come, that's up to them. But at least you did your job of inviting. Boaz made that mistake. He didn't invite him because he thought he's going to answer the problem of uh, causing of not, you know, of uh, not causing him uh, pain. But he's also, but he is causing him pain because he didn't invite him. So you're sort of doomed no matter what you do. But here, the Gemara is telling us that this way is worse. It's worse not to invite him because you are, you're, you're clearly, um, you know, leaving him out. So that's one explanation. And um, there is another explanation that Boaz did not want to take any gifts from Manoyach. So normally, what would normally be done is when you went to one wedding, you would give a gift, and then when they went to your wedding, you would, you know, it was there was sort of like a way where you weren't really giving a gift because you ended up paying it back. And uh, um, in this situation, Boaz was, was not interested in receiving a gift. And here, he never would have been able to pay it back because Manoyach did not have any weddings where he would be able to pay it back. So it would have been like receiving a gift without paying it back. And therefore, Bayaz did not want to do this because Bayaz was of the opinion, which we, we once mentioned earlier, 
about some people who don't want to ever receive gifts. They don't like to take things for free. And that is a, uh, an, you know, a, a very nice custom to follow. The only thing is, in this situation, it was wrong because it caused such pain to Manayach that he's not, uh, you know, that, that, that he's not inviting him. So it's very nice. You want to be extra, you know, extra careful about not receiving gifts, but not at the expense of someone else. So that's, uh, that, you know, that's a, uh, another interesting point that we see here of how you, you know, it's very nice to be extra religious, but, you, you know, uh, beyond the letter of the law, but you, know, you have to know if it's at the, the expense of, of course, you have to follow the laws, but if you're doing something that's beyond the letter of the law, you have to know, is it at the expense of someone else, which, which is often the case where, you, you know, every time you choose to do something that's beyond the letter of the law, it always carries with it something that you're go going to be, end up being more lenient in. It just happens to be that way. Uh, sometimes you can't, you can't really always, uh, you, 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 you can't always get your, what you want. It, 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 for example, I'll give you an example. There is a, uh, uh, sad time during the year, the week of Tisha B'Av. The week of Tisha B'Av is a very sad time. So there's a question in the Shulchan, in the law, in the code of law, about wearing Shabbos clothes on Tisha B'Av, on Shabbos before Tisha B'Av. Should you wear the Shabbos clothing or should you wear your weekday clothing? On the one hand, to show mourning of uh, Tisha B'Av, there's reason to say maybe you shouldn't wear Shabbos clothing uh, because it's the week of Tisha B'Av. On the other hand, it's Shabbos. It's, you know, on the other hand, it's Shabbos. On Shabbos, we don't show mourning. So you have these two, whatever you do, you can't win them both. Either you're go if you're going to wear Shabbos clothing, you're going to be emphasizing the beauty of Shabbos, but you're minimizing the mourning of Tisha B'Av. If you're going to wear weekday clothing, you're going to be magnifying the importance of, of acknowledging Tisha B'Av, but you are going to be minimizing the beauty of Shabbos. So sometimes, you know, you can't really, you, you, you try to do something extra strict, so you, but you're, you end up being uh, lenient on the other end. Uh, so that's, you know, very often that's how things work, and you always have to be extra careful. I mentioned that here because... This is what Boaz was trying to do. Maybe he was trying to be extra careful not to take any gifts from anyone, but at the same time, he was causing someone, he ended up causing Manoyach uh, to feel insulted that, he's, uh, that he doesn't have any kids. So that's, the, uh, that's going back on a little of what we were talking about with Boaz, who are uh, the Sefer Shoftim, the Book of Judges, doesn't call him Boaz it calls, it, calls him Ivtsan. And we're following that view that says Ivtsan is the same person as Boaz. There, there, there are two opinions. One opinion is that this is the same person as Boaz. So then we started uh, uh, talking about, we, we began chapter, chapter uh, 13. And this chapter is all about the beginning of Shimshon. And Shimshon was considered a Nazir. And we spoke a little about a Nazir last week. And we mentioned that a Nazir is not allowed to drink wine or anything from grapes. Or, and a Nazir is not allowed to take a haircut. Now, normally, a person who is a Nazir Oilam, a, a, a Nazir forever, would be allowed to take a haircut once a year. A, a certain leniency of a Nazir, uh, a, a Nazir forever. Shimshon was not even allowed to do that. Shimshon was not supposed to um, even take a haircut once a year. And Shimshon also, we mentioned, was 
a different nazir, different type where he was allowed to become impure. He, he didn't have that same rule. It was a different, he was in a different category. He was similar to a Nazir, but not exactly the same rules. We see two separate, two differences between his rules and the laws of a regular Nazir in the fact that um, he wasn't allowed to take haircuts and uh, which most Nazirs are not allowed to take haircuts, but a Nazir that is a lifetime Nazir was allowed once a year. And, uh, and Shimshon wasn't allowed. And the other, the leniency of Shimshon was that he was allowed to become impure uh, by going near a, by going near a dead body. Um, It would seem that there's another difference, and that is that he, his mother, he, he's a Nazir from, from birth, and his mother is not allowed to either drink wine or uh, um, because whatever she drinks or eats, ends up going to the baby uh, through, you know, uh, so he uh, ends up absorbing some of that. So the, um, the angel tells her not to, uh, not to drink wine or, or aged wine and not to eat anything that's, um, that's impure or things that are prohibited for a Nazir, according to the explanation that we gave that she, that that's what's prohibited. She has to be careful not to eat anything that's, that's prohibited, which Rashi and the, the commentaries explain that's what it means, even though the, the literal translation means something impure, but she wasn't really prohibited from things that are impure because Shimshon was not prohibited from becoming impure. Now, I also mentioned, and I don't know if I emphasized it enough, that the, the situation here is very different than the other shoftim, the other judges. And the reason why this is different is because the Jewish people, this is expressed at length by one of the commentaries here, the Radak. Shimshon has a whole different way of how he's going to save the Jewish people. He is not going to save them by leading an army to fight the enemy. The enemy that we're talking about here are the Plishtim. These are those that, these are the people that are harassing the Jewish people. And Shimshon is supposed to be saving the Jewish people from them, not by starting a war. And the reason is because the Jewish people do not deserve to win a war at this stage against the Plishtim. Therefore, Hashem is going to save us, but not by means of a war. Rather, Shimshon is going to be a terrorist. He's a tzaddik, he's a, he's a righteous person but he is going to cause terror among the Plishtim. And that's what's going to cause the enemies not to want to take revenge against us because Shimshon is just an individual. So they see Shimshon, even though he's really our, our leader and he's our, our judge, but he acted as a individual. So the enemy did not have an excuse to fight an all- uh, an all-out war against the Jewish people because who, who, who started up with them? One guy. So this one guy, they couldn't, you know, so that was really how we, you know, how we were safe from the, from the Plishtim without winning a war. We didn't deserve a war, but we did have this, uh, this uh, Shimshon. Now, the way Shimshon is, goes about getting, uh, keeping things safe and showing the Plishtim not to start up was by him falling in love with Plishtim women. 
And this way he would hang out there, live there with the plishtim, and then get into a fight there. And uh, this is how uh, this is how Shimshon, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 sort of like uh, uh, keeps the enemy uh, afraid of of really, uh, you know, harassing us anymore. I, I, I just remembered there was one point that I wanted to bring out on the previous chapter. And um, if I push it off for later, I'll probably forget. So let me mention it. It's just a thought, but, I th- but it's an interesting thought that came to my mind. And uh, you're welcome to, uh, to disagree because it's, I didn't see it anywhere. Uh, but it's just a thought. And the thought is that we were talking about the people of Ephraim that started a, um, the people of Ephraim were very angry at Yiftach for not including them in his, in his war. And, uh, it, not, right, not including them in, in his army. And uh, ultimately it created a whole war between them. And uh, in the end, it was very sad because a lot of people from the Ephraim tribe were killed. 42,000 people fell from Ephraim. This was a civil war, very sad story, how the Jews were killing other Jews. And um, the way they found out if the people were from Ephraim was because the Ephraim people could not say the word sheboilas with a shin, they could only pronounce the letter sin. So what, what comes to mind is that we find two things about these Ephraim people. We find that earlier on, they were, they were very sensitive and insulted. They were insulted when earlier Gidon did not include them in his army. And they're insulted here that that Yiftach doesn't include them in his army. So we find these two cases that they're insulted. And we also find that they had an impediment where they couldn't say the letter Shin. So what comes to mind is that when people have some type of a insecurity, it causes them to be much more sensitive and insulted. And because maybe they couldn't pronounce the letter Shin, therefore they were overly feeling overly insecure and um, more and, and overly humiliated when the judge never really even thought about, had, had anything negative in mind, but they were, they were just so self-conscious that they were insulted. And so what it seems, at least this is just a thought, what it seems like is it's based on the fact that they couldn't say the letter Shin, that they were, or, or, you know, that they had this insecurity which maybe caused them to become such uh, such sensitive people, and I think the the message is two things. Number one is everyone has some type of insecurity, and we always have to be sensitive, even if we don't know what their insecurity is. But that ins- that issue that they might have, that skeleton they might have in the closet, or that issue that they have that they're constantly trying to cover up. It's, it, it, it causes us and it causes others to be overly sensitive because whenever you do something against them, it sort of brings up this idea that they are, you know, they're feeling um, insecure from their other issue. And now you've now hurt them doubly because you've, you've, you've brought up the fact that they feel uh, insecure from something else, and now you also insulted them now. So it's a it, it's really a, a a lesson how to treat others and how we ourselves should never um, 
we should always push aside any insecurity in us because other people don't, are not taking advantage of it. They're not trying to insult us from it. And we sometimes get insulted, but every person has insecurities. And therefore, maybe there is, uh, there is uh, you know, we, we really should try to move on and move forward and not feel, uh, you know, uh, so insecure and so uh, such issues. And this way, we won't be as sensitive and as fragile as the uh, Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim. Anyway, this is just a thought that came to my mind. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, so maybe I shouldn't be uh, uh, entering into a field that's not, uh, I don't have any uh, education in, but it's just a, a thought and uh, you're welcome to uh, take the thought or argue with me. If anyone has anything they wanna say about that, be happy to, to listen. I agree. <laughs> okay, thank you. I was a psychiatric nurse for over 40 years. Uh -huh. and, I, and I agree. Uh huh. Wow. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, anyway, you, you know, you see different things. I, I, it's interesting. It was interesting to see that, you know, if you like read the chapter again, you sort of like see the connection there. So, I, I felt obligated to, uh, to share it. I thought it was an interesting connection. Okay. Uh, um, yes. Rabbi? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think this is a point that's very well taken. Um, I've seen it over and over again. If there's something that they feel insecure about, sensitive about, they hop on the slightest thing to say, oh, the person is insulting them. Uh, I've seen this. I've seen uh -huh. this many times. I also wanted to ask you, <clears throat> Well, it, it's my thought. I don't know. I think I may have mentioned it before, but I think maybe Boaz was fearful of an evil eye from Manoah. Um, and that may have been one of the reasons he didn't want to invite him. Although I recall a story whereby a lack of an invitation gave rise to a sense of such... Uh, that it affected the actual destruction of the temple. That was a different story. But it, mm. it, we have to be very careful, you know, about our own sensitivities and not including people in the cloud. And the other thing that concerned me, I, I don't know, but you mentioned, you know, of course, Nazir are not supposed to drink alcoholic beverages, and I can see why the mother could not. But... Did that include grapes, grape juice, which are not fermented? Or is that a, a humra? Is that an additional thing? I mean, that could she? Yeah, no, it does include grapes and even the, even the pits of the grapes. Me, me, me zog, even, the, oh. even the skin of the grape and even the, uh, the pit, uh, the, wow. the, the, the seed of the grape. Yeah, yeah. So, um, right. So it's, it's not only, uh, the, the actual uh, wine. Um, thank you. Uh, about what you said about the invitation, about the inviting, uh, the, um, you know, number one about the evil eye, it does mention, and I think, think that's an interesting explanation, an interesting point, but I will also mention that, one of the ways to get out of an evil eye is if you're not jealous of anyone else. Only those that are jealous of others are affected by someone being jealous of you. So it, your explanation that Boaz maybe was nervous, that Manoach would have been jealous of him, and this would have affected Boaz, because he has a lot of children, and Manoach is jealous of him, that might affect a judgment in heaven against him, because then they have to reevaluate, does Boaz really deserve all of what he has, and, um, and uh, you know, and, uh, and, um, and then Boaz would, could possibly lose it. And maybe, and maybe you're right, because maybe that's why 
Boaz ended up losing his children because maybe Manoach was insulted. He wasn't invited in the first place because, you know, he was insulted and it caused a, uh, like a heavenly judgment against Boaz, which caused the evil eye ultimately uh, that, that, that Boaz's children passed away. Now, that's, not, you know, obviously together with other, with, with other ideas, um, you know, with other sins that they are other points, not just, you know, the, the evil eye there, obviously with some other, it was, it's also mentioned that, that, um, the, uh, the, 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 the children that he had, it's, it mentions that they, there was a, a concept of uh, judgment on them that they, the, the 60, 60 is a number of judgment. It's, it's mentioned Shishim Hema, uh, there were 60, um, um, I uh, forget the, the term, uh, Shishim, um, there are 60 like uh, um, fighters, it uses the term, there's a verse and it's slipping my mind now, but there's a verse about the 60, which 60 is a number of, of judgment, like the, the level of gvura, of, of, of strength, and, uh, and that's why Boaz's final son was Oyved. Oyved is the eye in Bez, which is, the, which is uh, connected to mercy. And uh, Oyved, the, 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 the letter is uh, Ayin Vav Bez Dalit. And so uh, Oyved is Ayin Bez, which is mercy. And, and Vav Dalit is do, which means, which means double. Uh, the, uh, so somehow the that the, the first 60 children that Boaz had were connected to the level of of, of severity so the level of severity and, and, and discipline and, and, and justice is sometimes connected to the evil eye and so it's interesting that you bring that up that the uh, that the uh, maybe there was an evil eye that 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 he was nervous of and I'm just adding on that maybe it actually was an evil eye that ultimately caused them to to pass away, together with the fact that he caused the insult and it caused the judge, you know, caused the Manoich was insulted and it caused the judgment. But I was also mentioning that a trick against the evil eye is not to be jealous of anyone else. That if you're not jealous of anyone else, someone else's jealousy of you is normally not supposed to take effect. And that's why Joseph's uh, descendants never had the evil eye effect. That <clears throat> uh, David, uh, someone was saying, Rabbi, someone, no, it's Moshe. Moshe. Moshe, yeah. Yeah, Rabbi. Assuming he was he was afraid that uh, I mean that he was under din, but of course, uh, you know, he, for, had he invited Manoah Boaz, maybe the the severity of the din could have even been worse. So he had to make a decision between the two kinds of din that he would be confronted with, and he chose this din instead. It's not a matter whether he would have had it or not. It's a matter he could have been confronted with two kinds of din, and he chose if he had invited him. Maybe the severity could have been much worse, because there was something. There may be other factors involved here that maybe you know that were maybe it's that we're not understanding. Uh -huh. so, Thank you, Moshe, for mentioning that. But the only thing is that from the Talmud, I think we have to say that he made the wrong choice, because that's what the Talmud implies that he made the wrong choice, and so maybe he thought like you're thinking. But the final conclusion of the Talmud is that no, it actually should have invited Manayach and he made the wrong choice. Um, so again, it's an interesting thought that maybe, you know, we're trying to, uh, uh, you know, enter into the mind of, uh, of Bayaz, uh, who was a tzaddik. And, uh, but in any event, uh, yeah, these are interesting thoughts that, uh, you know, that, that, that are... Um, that are, uh, you know, the, 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 it actually, it, it, it reminds me of the story of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva lost 24,000 students. And we know students are just like children. And they all died. And one of the reasons they died was because it was 24,000. The number 24 is also connected to justice and, and the evil eye. And it's a, it's a concept of gavura, of severity. So can I ask you a question? Can I ask you one other question? Yeah, sure. Supposing, assuming, hypothetically speaking, that the Manoach was involved with a Vodazor, some form of a Vodazor, let's assuming he had been 
prior to the invitation, would have that made a difference? Would that made it, have made a difference? Well, this had, is the thing. I, I don't want to think about that. not advised them based on that. Yeah, I, I don't want to go down that path because we believe that Manoyach was a very righteous person, as we're about to see that. No, no, but I'm just saying, had it been, a, I, I understand Manoyach, but I'm just saying, hypothetically speaking, had he had been in a situation where he might have been involved with some form of a bone or and and he wasn't, and and Boaz thought, I mean, or somebody else. It doesn't have to necessarily be Boaz, but um, it, had somebody not invited, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm excluding Rabbi Kiva and and Boaz, but I'm just saying, had it been a, a, a hypothetical situation where that person uh, had committed a Vodazora and the other one decided not to invite him based on that situation. He had pre previously committed a form of a Bodazora. I mean, you know. Uh -huh. the, well, it, it, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it just doesn't seem that that fits anything that we learned. No, I understand. But I just, and, I was just trying to see if and, uh, and it, it, for that it doesn't seem like, yeah, it, do, it doesn't seem like that. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not sure how to, you know, how to take that. I don't see how we could even think of such a thing. No, I understand, but beyond my, yeah, I'm just saying, uh, I, you know, there, there are certain things that you could dream about and think about. I don't know, just like it doesn't seem like yeah, it's but I was just going trying down to the right it. path. It seems like that would be like taking us in the wrong yeah, direction. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. But, um, Thank you. But very, very interesting points that, that both of you mentioned, uh, Amosha and Phyllis and, uh, and uh, okay, we're going to uh, continue on a, a, a we were we were learning about Manayach now. Now we're we're actually learning about Manayach, and we're in chapter thirteen. Um, And we're on verse base. Let's see. Yeah, is that what you remember from last week? We just we just started it. I thought we got further. Okay. Let, let's start from the beginning then. We'll just start from the beginning of 13, unless someone else remembers where we got up to. I don't have it written down where we reached. So I'm just gonna start from the beginning of 13. Right? Um, the children of Israel continued to do what was evil in the eyes of Hashem, and Hashem delivered them into the hand of the Plishtim for 40 years. There was a certain man of, from Mitzorah, from Mitzora, from Tzora, Tzora was a place, Tzora, of the family of Don, and his name was Manayach, his wife was uh, barren and had not given birth. An angel of Hashem appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now, you do not have any kids, have not given birth, you shall but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. So she doesn't know that this is a angel. She thinks this might be a prophet. That is, this is where she is, um, she, she's convinced that would, how would she deserve to see an angel who, she was very humble. And uh, we do know that she was definitely a very righteous woman. After all, she did merit to see this, this, this prophet, but she was humble and didn't think so. Um, and therefore she assumes that he must be a prophet instead of an angel. I should also mention that the term Ushmai Manayach, I'm not sure if I mentioned this last time, it, in the first verse, uh, I'm sorry, the second verse, in verse two, it said, um, his name was Manayach. There is another verse that in Shmuel that says, Naval Shemoy, that it uses the word the name first, and then the word Shemai. So the, sometimes the verse says, the, and his name is this, and sometimes it says, and this is his name. And there is a uh, discussion among the in, the, in the commentary that, uh, one of the commentaries, 
uh, brings uh, that you can tell if it's a tzaddik or a righteous person if it says and his name is this that's generally teaches us that this person is a righteous person and um and, uh, and, and what that means is that a person's mission is connected to the, the if the person is uh, uh, following the mission that Hashem gave him, or if they're sort of making their own mission. And so if it's, they're following the mission that Hashem gave them, so it normally says, and his name is so-and-so, meaning he's following the mission that Hashem gave him from his naming. And if he's taking the steps on uh, uh, doing things on his own, uh, substituting his mission for Hashem's, uh, 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 for, for his own mission instead of Hashem's, so then it would say um, his name first. His uh, novel is his name. That's the example given. The case of novel, uh, novel was his name, and. Um, and meaning that he sort of uh, chose his his own path, and uh, and so that's an interesting uh, uh, hint. And the reason, one of the reasons I mention that is that we do find something a little later here, where it says that Manoyach walked after his wife; he went after his wife. And the Talmud says that a man is not really supposed to walk behind a woman. And obviously the reason is because he might think about um, impu- improper thoughts and, and therefore a uh, uh, man should not have improper thoughts. And when it mentions that Manoyach went after his wife, uh, that would uh, that shows that he didn't. Um, he was con- the, the the Talmud mentions that it sounds like he was ignorant in Jewish law. So what we find is, on the one hand, Manayach is righteous. On the other hand, it seems that he wasn't so knowledgeable. Now the Talmud doesn't conclude that that way. It doesn't say clearly that the Talmud. The Talmud does give an answer that it doesn't mean. He went after his wife. He went after his wife's advice. Uh, so the Talmud has an answer for this statement, but it th- leaves it a little up in the year. So it's it's a little unclear how knowledgeable Manoyach really was. But at the same time, we still consider him righteous. So you know, so I'm just I'm just mentioning that. Uh, it, uh, on the one hand, you know, we have that it calls him the the uh, the, the the Medrash says. Ushmai Manayach, that you see from the fact that his name, that it mentions his name first, this, uh, this shows that, that he, uh, he followed Hashem. On the other hand, there is such a thought in the Talmud uh, at one point that maybe he was not so knowledgeable. But it doesn't necessarily conclude that way, but it does leave it a little up in the air. Now, we are going Rabbi to... Smith. Yes. I just want. To, I just saw this interesting thing, in, uh, I'm looking in Mayam Loes. So yeah. it says that Menoach was was righteous, uh, and his righteousness was even more exceptional because he came from the tribe of Dun. Dun was the lowest of the tribes. They were the most inclined towards idolatry, and also committed crimes of violence. So this is basically what is similar to what Moshe was saying. That for some for, for that tribe, he, he was a great tzaddik, and even more exceptional because he was part of that tribe. He was still uh-huh. a tzaddik, but the tri- the tribe itself was very inclined towards idolatry Idol. more than any of the other tribes. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay, thank you, Moshe. You have uh, uh, not exactly what uh, you have a little uh, uh, um, something to work on to work with. Indication. Uh, a little uh, uh, insight, not not that he, God forbid, ever worshipped idols, but that uh, that he was from a tribe that worshipped idols. So so now you can uh, you can take that that now you have what to uh, a little uh, a little seed to to work uh, to work with. Um, so thank you, David, for bringing that up and um, and, uh, and uh, very nice, very very interesting. So. Uh, we are now in uh, 
in verse 4, and now be careful not to drink wine or aged wine and not to eat anything contaminated, for you shall conceive and give birth to a son. A razor shall not come upon his head, for the lad shall be a, a Nazarite of Hashem from the womb, and will begin. he will begin to save Israel from the hands of the plishtim. So um, this is an interesting point that, uh, like, for example, if a woman has to, uh, a woman is pregnant, she should be careful um, everything that she eats, because whatever she eats becomes, uh, goes to the child. And so, uh, uh, for example, uh, the same thing applies to a woman who's nursing. I know in Shulchan Aruch, in Code of Law, it mentions about a woman, if a woman needs to uh, eat something for medicine purposes, but it's not kosher, that it's problematic for her to nurse her baby. Uh, after the, after she eats what's not kosher, maybe she should have someone, uh, you know, someone else nurse her baby, or they could use a formula, uh, because uh, whatever she eats, uh, you know, everything that goes, that she eats ends up going into the baby, and it could have what's called timtum halev. It could, uh, uh, in, in, in Yiddish, the term would be Farstop the cup. It'll uh, it'll make the the it'll, it'll clog up the brain. Well, t- it doesn't literally mean that. It, it actually, uh, timtum halev would mean clog up the heart. Uh, Farstop the uh, the hearts. Uh, it'll clog up the heart. But I think the term in Yiddish is farstop the cup. I don't know. Miranda is uh, aren't you Stuff a Yiddish? Heart. What? Stop the heart. Stop. Yeah, no, but there's some Yiddish term. Well, for stuff the cup is definitely will stuff the head, but the head is also related to understanding. When you right. say put on Yiddish a cup, it means start thinking in Yiddish or something. So, possibly. But, but is, is that a Yiddish uh, term for stop? Uh, it is. For stop it the is. Cup? It is. It's okay, for good. confusion. It means confusion. The person has too much in their head uh-huh. and they can't figure out right and wrong kind of a thing. Okay, good, good. So, so that's the anyway. that's one of the reasons. Thank you, thank you, Miranda. Yes, that's uh, very important to eat kosher food because otherwise you could get timtum halev, which uh, which really means it clogs the heart uh, and it won't let you love Hashem as much as you should. It won't let you uh, have you will it'll have a negative effect on. Uh, on you and, and, and how much more so people will do whatever they can for their children, even more than they would do for themselves. <laughs> so this would mean that uh, uh, a woman who's, um, who's pregnant or if she's uh, nursing her baby, she would want to be extra careful to uh, only have the, the, the most uh, highest level of, of, uh, of kosher, uh, you know, for her, for her child. And um, uh because every little, every little thing, every any negative thing, uh, will could have a could have an effect on the any small thing, thought or you know, uh, can have an effect, a negative effect on the child. And um, and so here we uh, the, the 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 prophet is telling. Um, this wife of Manoach, her name is Tzalal Foyni, or Tzalal Foynis, that, uh, that, she, uh, that she should be careful about all these things. Now, but the next verse says that the woman came and told her husband, saying, a man of Hashem came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of an angel of Hashem, very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. So she's mentioning that he had an appearance of an angel, meaning that she couldn't believe or imagine that it was an angel, but she, 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 she just assumed that, you know, he was a, uh, a prophet. And it says when a prophet has prophecy, they look like an angel. Now, the reason why he's going to be a Nazir, I don't know if I, if I connected this last time, uh, but the reason why he needs to be so holy 
is because he's got this very peculiar or off the beaten path type of uh, um, uh, 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 road that he's going to be taking. He is going to have to be uh, extremely careful how, because he's got such a delicate and fragile job that any wrong step could have devastating uh, effects. He is going to be hanging out amongst the lowest of the low. Yeah. He's going to be living among the plishtim, and he's going to uh, uh, have numerous uh, opportunities to sin. Uh, he's hanging out there, and they obviously don't have much ethics or morality, and, uh, and um, you know, he's got every desire, uh, uh, you know, in front of his eyes, and he is going to have to be extra careful. See, it's a lot easier if you have no sin, no opportunity to sin around you than uh, for someone who uh, lives in a community that's full of sin and there's all these opportunities. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a huge, there's a huge difference. Shimshon is going to be in this, in, in, so the way he's going to stay strong and have this self-control is because he's holy. Because he's so careful, he's not indulging in, 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 in wine, in alcohol, and, um, and uh, he's not going, and his, his hair is going to be, uh, un, you know, he's not going to have the, uh, the good looks that, that may be a uh, 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 person who takes away. Oh, God. It's the Jade Wentz office. Uh, the the uh, I'm not going to have the looks of of uh, maybe a very nicely well shaved uh, you know well groomed uh, person. Uh, not shaved. I don't want to use the word shaved. I'm sure he had a beard, but the uh, his hair. I'm sure was uh, you know it was it, you know when it gets that long, you know it doesn't look like the the, the professional look, and um, and so. He's going to be have to you know not concentrate on his looks. He's going to concentrate on holiness. So it, it, by by do by living in the, these areas, he needs to have that extra uh, holiness to him in order not to be impacted by these uh, by the desires that are around him. So uh, now we're going back to the verse uh, verse number. Seven, he said to me, behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son. And now do not drink wine or aged wine and do not eat anything contaminated for the lad shall be a Nazarite, a Nazir, until unto Hashem from the womb until the day of his death. So he's meant to be this Nazir forever. So he's got this spe special mission where he's going to have to... Uh, it's going to have to uh, be extra holy. And um, and Manayach is is a little unclear. He either uh, doesn't, you know, he, he he's nervous because may, he didn't actually hear the command from Hashem, and uh, he's nervous that maybe his wife might have missed something, or uh, maybe um, you know he he basically would like to hear it straight from the. Uh, from this Navi, who he thinks is a Navi, or uh, uh, this prophet, he wants to hear it from him again, uh, or, or, or an angel. So Manayach prayed to Hashem and said, please, please Hashem, may, may the man of whom, of Hashem, whom you sent, come now again to us and teach us what we should do with the lad who is to be born. So he davens to Hashem, and Hashem listens to his prayer. We're in verse 9. And uh, Hashem heeded to the call of Manayah. And in truth, he really, the commentaries mentioned he really, Hashem didn't have to do this because 
uh, Manayach heard everything correctly from his wife, and so there wasn't really much that was necessary to add. But Manayach was nervous, and Hashem heeded to his request. Hashem heeded to the call of Manayach, and the angel of Hashem came again to the woman when she was sitting in the field, but Manayach, her husband, was not with her. The woman hastened, she ran and told her husband, and she said to him, behold, the man who came to me that day has appeared to me. So now she comes and runs to tell her husband. Manayach, verse 11, Manayach arose and went after his wife. Now this is the source of that Talmudic statement where I mentioned that she, that Manayach is going after his wife, and the Talmud says that's a problem. A man should not really go um, uh, after his wife. Rabbi. Yes. Uh, I, it's Ezra. Uh, I have a problem with that if they're using this as a as as the source, because number one, she knows where the man was. He has no idea where she where he goes, where he's to go. So therefore, he has to follow his wife. So this is this should not be a source to you know to say that. Because he followed his wife, you know, he, he wasn't uh, cognizant of, of the law, etc. I mean, I wish, it, to me, this is sort of like a, a, a common sense thing. Is you know the way, lead, and I'll follow you. I mean, you know, what's, so, so, so I it's just a good, don't good understand the, yeah. the, 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 under, the, you know, the statement of the, of the Rebbein based upon this particular event. Right, right. You're asking a good question on the, on the Talmud. And uh, I mean, on, on a simple level, you could just answer, the, the simple answer to your question could be that, you know, he, 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 he knows, he, he, I mean, she knows how to describe where, you know, where the angel is. Go to the left, go to, go to the field outside. He's right in the middle of the fields. He's right at the north of the field. I mean, she, he could have, you know, there, there, there is a, 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 an answer uh, you know, where she could just uh, describe, you know, if it's prohibited for a man to walk after a woman, then, you know, to, to have to, they have to solutionize and, and find a way where it's permissible. Now, I, I did mention that the Talmud doesn't necessarily conclude this, that this is a source that Manayach was uh, ignorant. And I see Rashi over here says, after his wife, after her advice that he should come and and check and, and, and find her. So in other words, did he actually walk after her or not? It could be that he just went after her advice, but she did advise him. But I do see the Matsudas David, who does say that she was the only one who knew where he is, implying like maybe, you know, he needed her to direct him. So similar to what you're saying, but at the same time, uh, you know, there there is such a, a thought in the Talmud that maybe that was wrong and maybe she should have, you know, somehow given him some type of a, uh, a uh, you know, a direction of where to go instead of, um, instead of going after. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's something when you study a tractate Erevin, you can, uh, uh, you can check it up. It's, it's, it's there in, uh, in, the, in the Talmud there on, uh, you know, in page 18. And uh, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can see it over there uh, in the Talmud where it discusses uh, about uh, the prohibition of, walking after a woman, and it brings up that, that idea. Um, but, uh, and, and it is a interest. it is a good point, you know, is it, you know, is it always pro prohibited? Are there exceptions and so on? Uh, Can I ask? Yes. Um, I don't understand. Okay, if you follow after a woman, you might have impure thoughts. But if it's, isn't your wife an exception? I mean, it's not inappropriate to have those thoughts for your wife. Right. So it, it depends. It would, it would, the point would be that it, it, it would not be appropriate to, um, to, to have thoughts when it's not, uh, you know, when, when, it, when it's not to, like improper thoughts, when it's not applicable, when it's not you know, when you're not with her privately, so to speak, you know what I mean? Then, then it wouldn't uh -huh. be, uh, be appropriate. Okay, everyone, it's uh, four o'clock already. Uh, uh, we'll have to call it a day. Um, see you tomorrow, Mitzvah